Well, allow me to add my welcome to all of you, and uh, as Cody has done, also to welcome those of you who are uh, new here to Brockhurst, perhaps in high school, college, seminary. Uh, welcome on behalf of all of us here at Brockhurst, uh, staff, students, alumni, board, uh, great to have you here, and uh, trust this will be a meaningful season of your life. Perspective uh, is a way of looking at things uh, from a particular perspective vantage point, if you will. And so you can look at anything from a particular a nuanced uh, position and see different things. And you can look at, for example, uh, art and look at from the perspective of composition or subject matter or, or technique or materials used. We could look at a car from the perspective of its engineering, its design, its aesthetics, its functionality, its speed, its quality. Uh, automotive technician uh, had an interesting perspective. He wasn't able to repair this car, and so he said to the customer, uh, I wasn't able to fix the brakes, so I made the horn louder. <laughs> interesting perspective. Uh, veteran politician uh, once uh, said uh, this, uh, to err is human, to blame it on somebody else shows management potential. <laughs> well, those are perspectives that you can have. Uh, today, I want us to have a perspective on the state of the church in Canada and more particularly, the state of Christian higher education, state of the academy, and the state of this institution. And I want to invite you to shift from your perspective to the perspective of a balcony. Because you can look at, for example, a college student, you might look at uh, education from the perspective of, of, well, education has just become so expensive. And maybe you're looking at uh, the state of the academy from the perspective of a teacher or an, an educator. And you're thinking is, how do we shape minds when they're so impacted by this, this dribble we call social media? Or we might look at it from the perspective of the marketplace or, or the church leader, and, and they're saying, boy, we need graduates who, who uh, have more competence, soft skills, or, or we need graduates who uh, know how to iron shirts. And so you can look at it from different perspectives. I'm inviting you to, to, to come up to the balcony and, and look at all the moving parts at the same time. It's sort of an aerial photograph from 35,000 35, feet. What do we see going on? What's happening in the church? What's happening in education? And, and then how are we going to move forward? That's the perspective I want to invite you into. So whether you're in grade nine or whether you're in administration or whether you're in, in operations, wherever you are in this institution, we're all going to be one and we're all gonna try to look at the perspective from the balcony, from a high level and see what's, what's going on and how are we going to generate some forward motion from this vantage point. So here's what we see and here's certainly what we know. We know that the church in Canada is largely flat, not much sparkle. And that's actually putting it rather nicely. If there are growing churches, they're more than likely conservative, Bible-believing evangelical churches. Some churches are growing because of marginal evangelistic initiatives. Some churches are growing because of new Canadians that are coming to Canada, bringing their faith with them. And so there's been some generation of some, some excitement and some growth in those contexts as well. But for the most part, most churches, well over three quarters, have either plateaued or more likely in decline. Atheism is growing. Recent Angus Reid survey, Canadian survey, tells that 1976% of those surveyed would have identified themselves as atheists. Today, that number would be 13%. And among millennials, that's doubled yet again. And so one in four Canadians have, have completely disengaged from anything to do with religion in any sort of capacity. And so Canadians have long left the church. And most evangelical churches, most Bible-believing churches, and virtually all mainline churches, are more concerned about survival than impact. There are exceptions, but there's a whole lot of anxiety. Now, this is our reality. 
please know that I'm coming today as an optimist and there's all kinds of opportunities, but this is our reality. We are taking on water. The context, the setting, the situation that we find ourselves in is nothing short of severe. These are the days we find ourselves living in. We know that fewer and fewer Christians believe in sharing their faith. Barna Research is telling us this. We know that institutions like ours, there has been a, a decline in the interest of global mission enterprises. Thankfully not here. One of our most effective strategic mission programs is our TESOL program. But, but overall, the, the passion for global missions is, is on the decline. And we know, we know that one of the most socially and politically uh, insane things you could do is to actually share your faith. I mean, that is just so antithetical to everything our culture believes in today. To imagine that you have an inside track on truth that you would want to share it with somebody else. And it has effectively muzzled us. Again, there are exceptions. But overall, we've been beaten into, into silence. We know the cost of education has doubled in, in all contexts, including ours. And parents are more and more concerned about seeing their children get an education that leads to employability, that leads to marketplace opportunities. And we know that's resulted in overall decline in the study of the humanities, an overall increase in STEM programs, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Uh, we know that campus issues today are very different than they were a number of decades ago. Sensitivity and concern for indigenous issues and the need for reconciliation. Issues related to freedom of speech and academic freedom. And certainly issues related to, to mental health. The, these are enormous con concerns in, in colleges, and universities, and higher education, across the board. And the fabric of the home, the, the use of technology, shifts in culture, these all have an impact on culture. There are now hard studies to show that the use of technology is related to depression. And we're not even gonna to begin to touch on how that's teased out this morning. But, but all this has an impact on, on education and the task and responsibility of education. And institutions like ours, faith-based institutions committed to Christian higher education, were either holding our own or more likely, more likely in decline. And so schools that had a bit of an increase still don't hit the numbers that they were hitting 10, 12, 15 years ago. We're, we're taking on water and the anxiety is palpable. It's real. And the question we want to ask, ask ourselves is, how, how will we move forward? How will we stoke the fires of devotion and intellect and creativity and passion and action in ways that will bring about benefit for the church and for the world? How will we get you so excited about your education that you'll go out and change the world, literally? How will we do that? How will we establish that kind of forward impact? And so this morning I want to talk about three pretty basic, pretty simple, but, but profoundly significant commitments that we all need to rally around. We all need to rally around that will help us navigate these turbulent waters. And so let, let's explore these three commitments that, that we need to rally around together for impact, not for survival, but, but moreover, for impact, because that's what we're called to do. The first one is to stay anchored. Stay anchored. This is a commitment to meaningful traditions. Now, tradition is sometimes viewed as an enemy of all that's creative and new. Let me show you something. Some of you have never seen this before. It's called a hymnal. And this is a Baptist hymnal. Now let me just tell you, I know uh, I feel young. You look at me as the old guy. But I want you to know that when I finished my education, or at least my, my, my uh, full-time focus education, I continued in season afterward. But, but when I finished college and then seminary, uh, the expectation was when you gave a message, the preacher uh, picked the closing hymn and, and led the closing hymn. Whether you're musical or not, you did it. And so uh, when I finished school, I had to learn how to, you know, 
use a hymnal and knit one in Pearl too. And, and that's what we did after. And then, and then we got an overhead. Because then we could put on the screen, you know, it only takes a spark. And, and so then we could be creative and, and innovative. Tradition, and, and sometimes we have this idea that this, this symbolizes tradition, and tradition represents everything that, that stifles. Listen, think differently. I wanna, I wanna challenge that, that, that perspective this morning. Tradition really is a transmission of customs and beliefs from one generation to the other. And there are things that are true, and there are, there are, there are things that work that those that have gone before us, leaders and mothers and fathers that have gone before us, have, have discovered that work and are true and they've passed on to us. And these kind of meaningful traditions need to be heralded and kept and maintained and passed on to the next generation. Now I use the word meaningful because we know that <laughs> within all of us is this, this capacity, this tendency for meaningless trends, uh, meaningless tra- uh, traditions. Where, where, you know, we all know that line, you know, the seven last words of a dying church, we've always done it this way. But that's not a joke because we really do think that way. And we get into ruts and routines and patterns and we think this is the way we've always done it. And those are meaningless traditions but there are all kinds of meaningful traditions that we need to continue to honor and pass on. The Old Testament has all kinds of meaningful traditions, the honoring of a Sabbath rest, the gathering of God's people for regular worship, the establishment of annual feasts and celebrations. These were parties to reflect upon the work of God and his intersection with human beings and fasts and the setting up of stones as as memorials to remember, to remind people that God did something profound and significant in our midst. And then of course in the New Testament we have all all kinds of affirmations of these kinds of rituals and meaningful traditions. And we have a, the continuance of, of these worship gatherings in what was now, what would now be called the, the, the church. And we have some new traditions established, baptism and, and worship around communion. And of course, the early church held high literacy and the reading of scriptures, the public reading of scriptures and and the teaching of scriptures and mentoring and discipleship and education. And then of course we had meaningful traditions as it related to our faith itself. Theological traditions, traditions of orthodoxy, that which united and galvanized the true church an embracing of the authority of of scripture, the recognition of the humanity and the deity of Jesus Christ, the significance of the atonement and Christ's work on the cross, and then of course our biblical anthropology, the, the, the sanctity of human life, the dignity of human life, and then of course our, our social theology and the, the holding high of, of, of marriage between a man and a woman. The need and the response we have to share our faith to the next generation because we are ill-informed, we are deceived, and we are far from God and we need the transformative power of the gospel. And these are the kinds of traditions that distinguish God's true church. The church that we love, the church that we're accountable to, and the church that we're going to continue to serve as an institution. We also hold high not just the traditions of our faith, but the traditions of education itself. We go back to the Old Testament, we go back to the, the practice of, practices of our, of our Hebrew parents. The reading, catechism, repetition, the application of, of, of truth into behavior and into lifestyle. The Greeks, of course, then gave us the study of the, of, of the liberal arts, the humanities, whereby the exploration of, of these first universal principles in order to make one a good citizen, and so grammar and logic and rhetoric, how we communicate, how we debate, how we, how we reason, how we think, philosophy, history, how we understand the past. And these have become tools, given us language, and given us 
ways in which we understand our complex world, time-honored traditions of higher education that equip us to think and to understand and to analyze and to solve and to create and to flourish. These are anchors, meaningful anchors, meaningful traditions that we need to continue to perpetuate and to honor and to reproduce. And so we as a Christian organization hold higher study of the scriptures. And as we take our, our, our diligence and our commitment and our devotion and our honoring of the authority of scripture, and then we look at the complexities of our world and our study of the humanities and the arts, we create worldview, Christian worldview, so that we, we interpret the complexities of our world from an unapologetically Christ-like and biblical perspective and vantage point. This is, this is what we do here. This is important. Th these are traditions, meaningful traditions that we honor and will continue to honor. And we continue to honor how we educate. And, and these, these traditional practices of mentoring, of life on life, Jesus said in Luke chapter six, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, he will be like his teacher. The passage doesn't say he'll know what his teacher knows, but rather he will be like his teacher because it was life on life, iron sharpening iron. And I've had three or four, and I've shared some of these people with you before. I've had three or four people who've profoundly shaped my life and I, although I'm different in temperament and personality, in so many ways I'm like them because they've poured energy and time and life into me. Th these are the kinds of traditions that are meaningful anchors for us to herald. And so you can, you can go to Christian institutions where you'll get less Bible we're gonna hold high the scriptures because they're profoundly significant, relevant, and authoritative for our life. But similarly, so you can go to institutions where you'll get a lot less study of, of other worldviews and other perspectives and other thoughts, and you'll have, it a, you'll have a limited capacity to understand the complexities of our world. Here at Paracos, we're holding high the, the, the value of the scriptures. Understand the complexity of our world in the arts and sciences, and then praxis. How, does this, how is this fleshed out, certainly in Christian ministry, in life, in vocation? This is what we're about. These are, these are meaningful traditions, and so we need to stay anchored. Where some institutions have departed, we're choosing to stay anchored on these cherished traditions, meaningful traditions, and values. Now, we also want to stay fresh. We need a commitment to be better, to do better, and to make better. Tradition needs to be honored, meaningful traditions, but there will always be a need to be creative, fresh, and innovative. To innovate is to make changes to something that's already established. You're not creating from nothing. You're, you're making changes to something that already exists. Now, innovation is a bit of a buzz, buzzword, and in fact, particularly disruptive innovation, and that really grows out of, it's a mis, misused and, and too frequently used uh, word because of an author who, in his book, Innovative Dilemma, back in uh, 97, Clayton Christensen, and, and so business leaders want to be thought of or perceived as the bleeding edge of innovation, so they use disruptive innovation all the time. And, and although it's a helpful language in some cases, we don't need to disrupt everything. We don't need to blow up education in order to continue to do education. But we do need to be creative. We do need to be innovative. We need to be constantly adjusting the sales. We, we, we need to be adaptive and generative. But we, we need to stay fresh, assessing, improving, and changing. In our institutions, in our, in our educational institutions, and in our churches. We need to stay fresh. And, and Jesus 
even taught about this when he said, when you have new wine, you don't put new wine into old wineskins because old wineskins are already all stretched out. And as this new fresh wine uh, ferments, it'll stretch and expand and it'll just ruin those wineskins. So you put new wine into new wineskins. And so Jesus himself was talking about the role of innovation because of the innovative message of the gospel. It was fresh and alive. And so we want to be better. We want to be better disciples. We want to be better musicians. We want to be better managers. We want to be better teachers. Whatever it is, we want to be better. And we want to do better. And so we want to become more efficient. And we also ultimately want to make better. Because listen, I've said this before, but listen, embrace this. Education was never intended to be just for you. When you have the mindset of a steward, a steward says, I own nothing. Everything I have is God's, and I'm a steward of that, and I need to dispense that stewardship. And so whether it's a gift, whether it's financial resources, whether it's education, God grants us the privilege of gifts, of education, of resource, so that we might share it with others. And so we want to be better, we want to do better, and we ultimately want to make better in our world because that's what the gospel does. That's what the message of hope and redemption does. And that's the stewardship for which we have responsibility. And, and I, don't, I don't say this about staying fresh and being better and doing better and being, as, as a pressure. We live with enough pressure. And not a, it's not a, an, an unachievable standard and it's nor, nor to suggest that we're doing things wrong, but we need to have this, as some would call it, a holy discontentment. Just this perspective that says, I am a disciple. And a disciple, by definition, is a learner. And many of you are anticipating graduation in April or in June, but we never graduate from the school of discipleship. And so as disciples, we want to always be getting better and growing in Christ-likeness. And when we see things that are broken or poorly run or poorly administered, we ought to want to somehow make it better and improve it. And so stay fresh. I love this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul here is talking about how we're responsible administrators of, of a new message, the new covenant. And he says this, and, and look at the screen for this. He, he says this, he, he says this, he's been talking about Moses and how Moses wore a veil because of the glory of God. And he says this, and we all with unveiled faces... Behold the glory of the Lord. And we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We are being transformed, not suddenly into an Autobot or something, but, but, but gradually, a, a metamorphosis literally is taking place where we're gradually being shaped into the image of Jesus. From one, I love that picture, one stage of glory to another. And so, wouldn't it be great if tomorrow you were just a bit godlier than today? And tomorrow you had a bit more competencies than you do today. And, and next week you had a bit more efficiencies than you, you do today. And a month from now you had some greater capacities for problem solving than you do today. And you deepen your walk with God. And you're staying fresh and alive and teachable and responsive. This is a disposition that we need to hold to individually and, and that we should have corporately as well as, as, as an organization, as an educational institution. So let me just say, if, you, if you're part of the Briarcrest team and you see something that could be done better, would you speak up? And managers, if you see something that we can do better, would you speak up? Students, 
We want to do the best job, job in delivering education to you. If you see ways in which we can help you learn better, would, would you speak up and help us? Real, I, I mean that really. I mean, history is full of the innovative expressions of youth and how they've bought, brought about innovation and transformation and renewal to the existing work of God. And would you then take that same disposition into the church? Because every generation is going to honor those time-honored traditions, but then put new flesh, new language, new, new, new packaging, new clothing to the ministry of the gospel. And so let's, let's stay anchored. The things that matter, not meaningless traditions, but meaningful traditions, and, and let's, let's stay fresh. Let's stay in that growing edge. And then lastly... Let's stay focused. You came into chapel today and I hope you received a copy of our Mission Vision prayer card. Those words matter. They really matter. Briarcrest is, this is our mission, Briarcrest is an institution of learning. Briarcrest is a community of learning. It calls students to seek the kingdom of God, to be profoundly shaped by the scriptures and be formed spiritually, intellectually, for lives of service, Christ-centered, Bible-anchored, and ministry-focused, service-focused. That's why we exist. Now, every one of us are, are here with our own subsets. We've, we're all here for a different reason, slightly nuanced different reasons. Staff, students, seminary, college, high school, faculty. We all, we all have our own sense of call and our sense of mission. But there has to be something larger that unites us all. What are these great divine directives that we commit ourselves afresh to? What are these great objectives? General George S. Patton once said, no man can do anything without knowing what he is doing. Generals and staff officers don't win wars. Soldiers win wars. The soldier, however, must know what he's doing at all times, he must know the objective. What is the directive? What is the mission? Now every soldier will have a very specific, defined responsibility, but that soldier still has to know what's, the, what's going on here? What's the larger objective? And in the same way, we need to remind ourselves afresh, what is our divine directive? What is the ultimate divine instruction from God? And let me start with our great priority. And I know in the college, Cody's been, your chaplain's been talking to you about it the last couple of days. The great priority of seek first. Seek first the kingdom of God. And then, and the context explains us, all these things will be added to, because the context is all about worry and fretting. And it's not worrying and fretting about crazy wild things, it's worrying and fretting about the stuff of life, food and shelter and clothing. He says, don't fret about these things. You focus on the great priority, which is seeking seeking the reign and rule of God in your life and in our world, the ultimate grand restoration of God, which will be final one day when Christ returns and complete. But in anticipation of that, we, we... We seek the kingdom of God. That's the great priority. And Jesus was once asked, what's the great commandment? Literally, he said, Jesus, what's the great commandment? And he said in Matthew 22, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, strength, and mind with the totality of your being. And the second one, it's like one coin, two sides. The second one is just like it. Love your neighbors yourself. And if you read 1 John, the epistles of John, he says, you know, loving God and loving others are, are symbiotically related. You can't separate the two. You can't say you love God and hate your brother. It just doesn't work that way. And Jesus, all of God's truth, all of God's law, all of God's directive, 
pivot around those two commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Love. And then, same book, Matthew, we have what's traditionally called the Great Commission. Go make disciples. And so the great priority is all about God first. And the great commandment is all about relationship. And the great commission is all about responsibility. This is why we're here. This is why we are an educational institution. This is why we're three schools. And this is why we're committed to producing leaders and influencers who equip the church and engage the world. Because we're seeking God. Because we love God. And because we love each other. And because we have a responsibility to disseminate this truth that we've been captured by and we've been, we've been profoundly impacted by and pass it on to the next generation or to those who, who don't yet know that truth. That's why, proclam- that's why we're here. And we, we dare not lose sight of that. We cannot lose sight of it. To do so would be at our own peril because any vision that's less that is far too small. Listen, we all have shadow missions. I have shadow missions. We all, we all have things which we can make sound really cool and really interesting and really altruistic and really sacrificial. And it's really about us. But if you don't love, we talked about this last semester when we looked at 1 Corinthians 13. If you don't have love, you've got nothing. You will end up old and alone. You have nothing. And, and you can be a competent leader and an outstanding researcher and a profoundly effective communicator and, 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 a, and a world-class athlete. And, 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 but if you don't have love, if you don't have a relationship with God and if you don't have a relationship with people, you've got nothing. Whoa, imagine if we were just a buzz with love. And don't say this is abstract. It's not you know, you know what it looks like when you show care and love for another person. Because you know what it feels like to have someone show care and love to you. Somebody has said, when in doubt, mumble. Maybe it's good advice if you're in doubt. No mumbling today. Our calling is clear. Our way forward in these complex, turbulent, volatile days is that we stay anchored to those meaningful traditions that matter, but that we also stay fresh and responsive as a learning organization, as disciples, adaptive and flexible, nimble on our feet, willing to create, because progress might look differently in 10, 15 years. The church will look differently in 10, 15 years. So we're gonna stay fresh. But we also need to stay focused. And when we commit ourselves to being anchored and to stay fresh and to stay focused, God is then going to take and use us in profoundly significant ways. Story. I have two children. My daughter is married. She has two little ankle biters. And when she was in kindergarten, she went through a rough patch. And it was about November, and she had a bump at school, and about the same time, her grandmother was retiring. And so she came on and said, I'm retiring from kindergarten. I mean, five-year-old talking to telling me I'm going to retire. And so then we started, we prayed with her all the time, but we started praying for her every day about her, her willingness and her enjoyment of kindergarten. And after several days and a few weeks of these regular prayers, we, on one November morning, were going to pray for her for school as she went off to kindergarten. She said, stop. You know, this five-year-old, and if you know her daughter, she's very, going to be very authoritative. Stop. And she says, I don't want you to pray for me today because I want to see if I can do it on my own. Well, terrible theology. <laughs> but how honest. Listen, we can do a lot of things without God. We can expend a lot of energy we can spend a lot of money. We, we can do a lot of back slapping and not touch eternity. 
So we kept praying for her. And she finished kindergarten. And the church has a future. And it may look different in the next generation because you will lead it. And education, Christian education, Christian education has a future. It may look different, but it's a future. But the church has a future and Christian education has a future only because we make sure God is in it. And so while we have the response to staying anchored and staying fresh and staying focused, we'll then let God do his work of using us as a force of impact for good, for the advancement of the gospel, to the glory of God, and to the next generation. Let's all stand for prayer. Our Father and our God, we just pause right now and thank you for the profoundly incredible privilege we have to be here right now. I pray that every student from grade nine to seminary believes this. I pray that every staff, teacher, faculty, administrator, every, every person who's part of the Barcrest team embraces this. Thank you for allowing us to be part of your mission in this part of the world here in Saskatchewan. God, we thank you for what you've been doing in our midst. Thank you for what you've been doing in our churches. And we know these are turbulent days. We know that the church is taking on water. We know it's uphill for Christian higher education. But God, we will not be thwarted. We refuse to be discouraged because you have given us a message of life. And we want to be stewards of that profound message. So would you bless and use the church in Canada, the church that calls the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? And would, would you use schools like ours and would you use Briarcrest to serve the mission of the church and the needs of our world? to the glory of Jesus Christ. We commit ourselves to this afresh today. In Jesus' name, amen.